We're going to talk about non-organic hearing losses now. Non-organic hearing losses are an apparent loss of hearing without any organic or natural disorder, so or with insufficient pathological evidence to explain the extent of a hearing loss. So non-organic hearing losses are not natural. They're not they're not real hearing losses, but you can't say that during a test. Indications of a non-organic hearing loss include the source of referral, so are they looking for medical compensation? The patient's history, sometimes patients come in again and again um, lying because they aren't capable of telling the truth. Their behavior during the and after the exam, if they have over-exaggerated postures, like they're staring very intently at your lips, that they um, are acting like they can't hear anything and how they perform on a routine hearing test. So it is impossible to fake a routine hearing test. Patients may exaggerate a hearing loss because they are incapable of more reliable behavior. They are willfully fabricating or exaggerating a hearing disorder. They have a psychological disorder. Observation of a patient and special tests for non-organic hearing losses often lead the audiologist to the proper resolution of the problem. There are different terms for this. Pseudo-hypocusis would be false hearing loss. Let's say, um, yes, yeah, pseudo means false, and then hypocusis would be hearing loss. Functional hearing loss is the term used by physicians to describe symptoms of a condition that is not organic nature. So functional hearing loss is what you would write on the audiogram, on the evaluation in your report. Psychogenic hearing loss is hysterical deafness. Let's say something very traumatic happened to a person and they believe they've lost their hearing even though they haven't. Uh, malignoring is a deliberate falsifier. And um, if you can believe it, more adult men are suspected of this than women. Indications of a non-organic hearing loss, like I said, the source of referral, patient history, behavior during the test, and inconsistencies on the test. And sometimes these symptoms are very easy to recognize, even by non-professionals. So the audiologist should be alert for exaggerated hearing postures. Remember I said staring so intently at a person's lips, over-exaggerating. Uh, say that again and whatnot. When a patient is referred to an audiologist with specifications and there's compensation involved, or now and again a hearing loss should be immediately come up as a concern. So the performance on routine hearing tests is the first clue of a non-organic hearing loss. There's test retest reliability in all patients with normal hearing. So it's like I said it's impossible to fake a hearing loss. If your threshold is um, it's you can't guess a hearing you can't guess a threshold. Your threshold is the lowest level that you can hear a sound and for a person that's faking a hearing test, there's no way their brain can um, consistently find a threshold or fall upon a threshold that isn't true. So these inconsistencies um, lead to, and wandering attentiveness lead you to realize that the person isn't correctly following the directions and um, you know not performing the test accurately as they should. Another indication is when an audiologist finds a difference between a pure tone average and the speech recognition threshold. If you remember from our earlier tests, these should fall within um, 5 to 10 B, dB of each other. So if a person's pure tone average is like comes out at 0, but their speech recognition threshold is at 40 or vice versa, you know that something's up. You should retest the patient. So SRTs that are better than pure tone averages, inconsistencies between thresholds, test retest, inconsistencies are all indications of a functional hearing loss. You can also use objective tests. Remember, objective tests are tests that the patient isn't involved in, such as tympanometry, distortion product autoacoustic emissions, or ABR tests. So you can determine a person's threshold through the ABR. 
and the lack of required cooperation would tend to discourage some people from malingering in the first place. You could say something like, the computer says that everything is okay, right? So um, the, the computer says everything is okay. Maybe you didn't understand my directions, and we should try the test again. Just by saying that, you might give the person like an easy out, and then they'd be willing to go back and retake the test and be um, more truthful. So these are the tests I spoke about. You could do acoustic reflex, auditory evoked potentials, OAEs. The best way to do this, you would never, ever tell a patient that they're lying. Um, you never use the word malingering. You always say, you know, in the report you would say a functional hearing loss, but you give the patient a chance to take an out. So, like you said, um, re-instruct them with the directions. Maybe you didn't understand. I said, like you to raise your hand. The lowest, I mean, at the softest sound you hear, even if you're unsure, you still raise your hand. Um, shift the blame to your own shoulders. Maybe you didn't understand what I was doing. The test is inaccurate. I must have done something wrong. Can we do it again? Because the computer says those OEEs or the ABRs that everything is okay. If it's a child that is um, with a functional hearing loss, there might be other stuff going on at home or in school. So you want to speak with the parents about that and maybe refer for other services. You cannot accuse the patient. Malingering is only approved when the person admits to it. Write suspected non-organic hearing loss on the audiogram of functional hearing loss. Avoid the word malingering. Um, do not hesitate to say non-organic.